The last days of death row prisoners. Death row, two scary words that spell out the imminent end for convicted prisoners. It's the period of time that leads to their death, but this begs the question, what goes through their minds in those last few moments? Do they feel remorse for what they've done? Do they reflect or spit in the face of the law? In this video, we would examine the last few moments of some of the most notorious criminals and the moments leading to their court-ordered death. How some chose to spend their last few hours would surprise you. John Wayne Gacy Gacy's early years unfolded against a backdrop of discord. His father, drowning in the clutches of alcohol, unleashed both physical and emotional torment upon Gacy, his sisters, and their mother. On top of that, Gacy had to grapple with the complexities of his sexuality. Attached to men in a society steeped in homophobia, he sought refuge in a marriage that led him to Iowa, managing his in-laws trio of restaurants. For a while, Gacy seemed to have it all, until the ominous clouds gathered in May 1968. Charged with sexually assaulting two young boys, his seemingly perfect life began to unravel. Pleading guilty to one count of sodomy, Gacy faced a 10-year prison sentence coupled with the collapse of his marriage. The bars held him for 18 months, but upon release on parole in June 1970, Gacy returned to his roots in Chicago, determined to rebuild. A new chapter unfolded, one where Gacy painted the facade of a successful life. Entrepreneur, family man, churchgoer, and the host of vibrant block parties. Yet, a sinister shadow lingered in the background. The disappearance of Robert Priest in December 1978 unveiled Gacy's dark secret. Behind closed doors, he lured, molested, and murdered young boys. Arrested on December 22, 1978, Gacy confessed to the gruesome killings, revealing 26 concealed bodies in the crawl space of his home. The wheels of justice turned, and in February 1980, Gacy faced trial for 33 murders, along with charges of sexual assault. Convicted and sentenced to death, Gacy spent 14 years on death row at Menard Correctional Center. Amidst the isolation, he turned to painting, showcasing his creations in auctions alongside grim collections of clowns, skulls, and birds. Yet, Gacy's brushes with the law did not secure his escape. Despite numerous appeals fueled by his legal studies, the execution date loomed, set for March 10, 1994. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Gacy, now at the Stateville Correctional Center, shared a final picnic with his family surrounded by prison walls. For his last meal, a bucket of KFC, fried shrimp, french fries, fresh strawberries, and a Diet Coke graced his table. The eve of Gacy's execution drew a crowd outside the prison, eager for the end of his reign of terror. Strapped to the execution chair, Gacy's last words, kiss my ass, echoed through the chamber, shrouded in controversy. Lethal injection claimed him, and Gary's body was consigned to the flames of cremation. Thus concluded the dark chapter of John Wayne Gacy, a tale of crime, punishment, and the chilling legacy of a man who wore the mask of a monster. Gacy was pronounced dead at uh, 1258. David Mason. David Mason's narrative unfolded from petty crimes to a reign of terror in Oakland, California, between March and December 1980. His unsettling spree claimed at least four elderly lives in their homes. In January 1981, a car chase with the police marked a dramatic turn. Mason eluded capture but abandoned his vehicle, providing authorities a crucial lead to his residence. Back at Mason's home, his mother and brother, realizing who Mason really was, cooperated with the authorities, sharing a video cassette left behind by Mason himself. David had no choice but to come clean. In a chilling confession, Mason detailed his crimes, leaving law enforcement with a clear case. A warrant led to his arrest on February 4, 1981, at a Holiday Inn where he offered no resistance. Mason's confessions expanded the roster of his crimes, including the murder of his lover, Robert Graw. Before his trial in 1983, Mason held at the Alameda County Jail conspired with an inmate to murder another. Pleading not guilty initially, he was found guilty at the five murders in January 1984 and sentenced to death. However, even from behind bars, Mason found love and married Charlene while on death row. 
Over time, he exhibited remorse, openly acknowledging guilt and expressing regret for the pain inflicted on victims' families. In a surprising move in June 1993, Mason voluntarily withdrew an appeal that could have led to a new trial and overturned his death sentence. His motive? To serve as an example for others to deter a path of crime. The execution date for August 24, 1993 drew near, and Mason granted journalists an interview, sharing insights into his time on death row and expressing his readiness to take responsibility. Refusing a specific last meal, he opted for the same food as his fellow prisoners. His final day was spent with his family, and his requests included unlimited phone access, a refusal to speak with a priest, and a simple glass of ice water. On August 24, 1993, Mason faced the gas chamber, declining the opportunity to delay his execution. With no last words, he became the last inmate executed in this manner in California. The fate of his remains remains shrouded in mystery, as they might have been cremated or buried in an unmarked grave, marking the end of a life marked by crime, remorse, and an unusual acceptance of destiny. Gary Gilmore Gary Gilmore's journey into crime commenced in his youth, facing his final arrest at the tender age of 14 in 1964. A swift descent unfolded as he was sentenced to 15 years in prison for assault and armed robbery. Released on parole in April 1976, Gilmore attempted a legitimate life in Provo, Utah, but failed, succumbing to his violent inclinations of theft and drinking. In July 1976, Gilmore escalated from a common criminal to a murderer. First, he robbed a gas station in Orum, Utah, fatally shooting Max Jensen, an employee. Undeterred, he continued the next day, robbing a motel in Provo and shooting the manager, Ben Bushnell. Accidentally injuring himself while attempting to conceal the murder weapon, Gilmore's crime spree unraveled. Arrested with the help of his cousin Brenda, Gilmore's trial in October 1976 lasted a mere two days. Found guilty of first-degree murder, he received a death sentence. Unusually, Gilmore accepted his fate, foregoing any appeal. This perplexing response stirred media attention, leaving many to ponder the motives behind his acceptance of such severe punishment. On death row, Gilmore embraced isolation, seemingly eager to end his life. Hunger strikes and suicide attempts punctuated his stay, underscoring his resolve to face execution. Given the choice between hanging and firing squad, Gilmore opted for the latter, deeming it less prone to error. I prefer to be shot. The evening before his January 17, 1977 execution, Gilmore requested a simple last meal. A stoic acceptance of death characterized his final moments, and his last words, let's do it, echoed his unwavering resolve. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Let's do it. Gilmore's body, once a vessel of crime, took a poignant turn as he requested organ donation. His corneas found new homes, his ashes scattered from an airplane, marking the end of a life marked by crime punishment, and an unexpected gesture of altruism. Carlton Gary In the murky saga of Carlton Gary, an American serial killer, a chilling narrative of heinous acts unfolded between 1977 and 1978. Accused of raping nine elderly women and mercilessly claiming seven lives, Gary's journey through life was marked by frequent brushes with the law, painting a portrait of the least suspected perpetrator of these gruesome crimes. In December 1978, Gary found himself entangled in a South California robbery, leading to a confession and a hefty 21-year sentence. The twist in the tale came in March 1983, when barely five years into his term, Gary orchestrated a daring escape. A year on the run ended with his re-arrest, setting the stage for the unveiling of a darker truth. The investigation into the stalking strangler murders took an unexpected turn when evidence, a gun, and a fingerprint match pointed directly at Gary. No mere coincidence. His fingerprints surfaced at four distinct crime scenes, solidifying the case against him. Indicted in May 1984, Gary, despite admitting his presence in the victim's homes, vehemently denied the murders, insisting on another perpetrator. Amidst the legal turmoil, Gary found solace in art during his years on death row. 
Confined to a six by nine foot cell, he spent solitary hours crafting Christmas and birthday cards, revealing a side to him that transcended his sinister past. A glimmer of positivity entered Gary's life in 1996 when he married a woman he met through a church group visiting prisoners. Despite his incarceration, he embraced fatherhood by adopting his wife's daughter, fostering a bond that defied the confines of prison walls. Hope flickered in Gary's heart for exoneration, yet repeated appeals bore no fruit. On December 16, 2009, mere hours before his scheduled execution, the Georgia Supreme Court intervened, considering the necessity of DNA tests to determine guilt or innocence. However, this lifeline proved temporary, as Gary's dreams of exoneration were extinguished in February 2018, with a new execution date set for March 15, 2018. Facing the imminent end, Gary, known for his charisma, declined a final meal and a prayer. Surprisingly silent in his final moments, at the age of 66, Gary succumbed to lethal injection at the Georgia Diagnostic and Classification Prison in Jackson, Georgia. The shadows concealed at the fate of his body, leaving behind the chilling echoes of a life marred by brutality, confinement, and the ultimate silence of execution. Wesley Allen Dodd Wesley Allen Dodd's sinister journey unfolded from petty crimes to a decade-long reign of sexual offenses, commencing at the age of 13. Targeting over 50 children under the guise of babysitting, Dodd's atrocities reached a chilling crescendo when he transitioned from sexual predator to murderer in 1989. Arrested for attempting to kidnap a little boy, further investigation unveiled the depths of Dodd's depravity. He confessed to the murder of three boys in Vancouver, his dark desires laid bare through a disturbing diary, clippings, and a trove of incriminating items found in his house. Charged with aggravated first-degree murder and attempted kidnapping, Dodd pleaded guilty to all charges and willingly accepted the death penalty. Given the choice between lethal injection and hanging, he chose the latter, mirroring the method he used on his last victim. Dodd, uninterested in appeals, asserted that execution was the only way to end his potential threat to society. A chilling revelation came as he declared he would continue assaulting and killing children, relishing every moment. Uh, I will kill again. His statements painted a picture of a man beyond redemption, eager for the release of death. Awaiting execution, Dodd used his time to advocate for his own demise, spreading awareness on pedophilia through interviews, TV appearances, and a self-defense booklet for children. Eventually executed by hanging on January 5, 1993, Dodd's last meal was broiled salmon and fried potatoes. In his final moments, witnessed by local personnel, victims' families, and prison officials, Dodd's last words spoke of newfound hope and peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. The execution marked a grim milestone as Dodd became the first person to be hanged in the United States in over 30 years. Following confirmation of his death, Dodd's body was moved to Seattle for an autopsy before being cremated, and his ashes were handed over to his family. The execution closed a dark chapter, leaving behind a legacy of horror and the lingering question of whether redemption was ever possible for Wesley Allen Dodd. Ted Bundy Ted Bundy is a name synonymous with infamy, carved by his dark legacy as one of the most notorious criminals of the 20th century. Between 1974 and 1978, he unleashed a reign of terror across various states, sexually assaulting and brutally murdering numerous women. In 1979 and 1980, Bundy, armed with legal knowledge from a brief stint in law school, represented himself in two trials. Despite his calm and confident demeanor during cross-examination, overwhelming evidence sealed his fate, resulting in two death sentences by the end of 1979. However, Bundy's macabre journey persisted. In 1980, he faced another trial for the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach in Florida, receiving a third death sentence by electrocution. Spending nearly a decade on death row in Florida State Prison, Bundy, true to death row norms, sought multiple appeals while concurrently granting interviews, revealing glimpses of his criminal mind. Speaking in the third person, Bundy disclosed his criminal exploits, 
portraying himself as a remorseless thief who took what he desired, extending this mentality to the heinous act of rape and murder. As his execution date approached, Bundy decided to confess to the detectives, admitting to the gruesome details of killing 30 women, engaging in necrophilia, and keeping decapitated heads as trophies. Despite delays, Bundy's execution date was set for July 2nd, 1986. In a horrifying climax, he confessed to revisiting murder sites and engaging in despicable acts with decaying bodies. The day arrived on January 24th, 1989, with Bundy's last meal consisting of regular prison fare, untouched due to his loss of appetite. Outside the prison, hundreds cheered, eagerly anticipating his demise. Inside, Bundy reconciled with his fate, making final calls to his mother. His last words expressed love for family and friends. Executed by electrocution at 7.16 a.m., witnessed by 42 people, joy erupted outside the prison upon confirmation of his death. Bundy's body underwent autopsy, his brain examined for abnormalities. Per his request, his ashes were scattered in Washington's Cascade Mountains, where he had disposed of some of the victims' bodies. The final chapter closed on Ted Bundy, leaving behind a legacy of horror and revulsion.